This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. In today's headlines, former CEO and founder of FTX, Sam Bankman Fried, arrested in the Bahamas yesterday. Bahamas Prime Minister says he will be promptly extradited to the U.S. upon formal request. Twitter's Trust and Safety Council has been dissolved. Meanwhile, the former head of the council trends on Twitter for some controversial past tweets. Election tension in Brazil continues. Protesters tried to break into the federal police headquarters after the arrest of an indigenous leader. In Philadelphia, a statue of Christopher Columbus has been covered up by a box for over two years, but not anymore. We have the story. And a Texas mom is leading the charge in getting sexually explicit books out of school libraries. Find out more about her mission. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Today's Tuesday, December 13th. Some exciting news for the scientific community first. The U.S. Department of Energy plans to announce what they call a major scientific breakthrough today. It's expected to be about developments in fusion energy, the process that powers the sun and stars. There will be a press conference this morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Nuclear fusion involves combining atoms. Scientists have struggled to get more energy out of the reactions than goes into them, but researchers at a national lab in California may have figured it out. Hmm. And fusion could tap into an infinite source of energy and help end dependence on fossil fuels. The process also doesn't generate long-lived radioactive waste, unlike existing nuclear fission technology. We will live stream the press conference on our website, entity.com. And for now, we move on to the former CEO and founder of FTX, Sam Bankman Freed. He was arrested yesterday. The arrest was made in the Bahamas after U.S. prosecutors filed criminal charges. He's facing likely extradition to the United States. And today's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. Authorities in the Bahamas arrested Bankman Freed at the request of the U.S. government Monday. He is being detained under the Bahamas Extradition Act. Bankman Freed has been under criminal investigation by U.S. and Bahamian authorities following the collapse of FTX in November. The crypto firm filed for bankruptcy when it ran out of money. It collapsed after its larger rival Binance decided to withdraw from a prospective rescue arrangement, and the cryptocurrency equivalent of a bank run ensued. Traders pulled $6 billion from the platform in three days. FTX could not meet all the incoming withdrawal requests because it apparently moved its customers' deposits over to Bankman Freed's investment arm, Alameda Research. Millions of FTX users lost access to their crypto wallets. It's unclear what charges Bankman Freed will face. The indictment was sealed. A list of charges including fraud and money laundering is expected. Bankman Freed was the second largest individual donor to the Democratic Party in this year's election cycle. He provided around $40 million in the 2022 election. Bahamas Prime Minister Philip Davis says the Bahamas will promptly extradite Bankman Freed to the U.S. once the indictment is unsealed and U.S. officials make a formal request. Bankman Freed was scheduled to testify on FTX's collapse virtually before the House Financial Services Committee on Tuesday. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. FTX's current CEO, John Ray III, will testify before the House committee today. His first act when he took over as CEO was to authorize filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Ray is a longtime restructuring specialist with over 40 years of experience. He oversaw Enron's liquidation and says the financial conditions at FTX were even worse than that. He called the management practices at the company unacceptable in his written statement to the committee and that never in his career has he seen, in his words, such an utter failure of corporate controls at every level of an organization. And Twitter on Monday disbanded its Trust and Safety Council. It was a volunteer group formed in 2016 to advise the company on hate speech and other issues in the platform. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more. Council members received an email that read, quote, As Twitter moves into a new phase, we are reevaluating how best to bring external insights into our product and policy development work. As part of this process, we have decided that the Trust and Safety Council is not the best structure to do this. Last week, three members of the council resigned, citing concern for the safety of Twitter users. 
Musk responded by accusing the council members themselves of refusing to take action on child exploitation. Yul Roth, the company's former head of trust and safety, also resigned in November. Roth has featured frequently in the so-called Twitter files along with Vijay Gaddy. They were both members of a group involved in high-profile moderation activities. Taibi described the group as a smaller, more powerful cadre of senior policy executives. He wrote that the group operated in a high-speed Supreme Court of Moderation issuing content rulings on the fly, often in minutes and based on guesses, gut calls, even Google searches, even in cases involving the president. Since the publication of the Twitter files, Roth has faced a wave of online criticism of another nature. Screenshots of many past Roth tweets with explicit inappropriate content of a sexual nature are being shared and commented on. Here's Roth on the Knight Foundation's Informed. I think the art of trust and safety as a discipline is developing the procedures by which really impossible, messy, squishy decisions about content on the internet are made. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, journalist Barry Weiss released Twitter Files Part 5 on Monday afternoon. She details how Trump was banned from the site despite Twitter employees determining that he had not violated Twitter's policies. The justification given was due to the risk of further incitement of violence. Weiss points out how other heads of state did in fact incite violence without getting banned, like the former Malaysian prime minister who tweeted that Muslims have a right to be angry and to kill millions of French people for the massacres of the past. Or Iran's Ayatollah who said that Israel is a malignant cancerous tumor in the West Asian region that has to be removed and eradicated. In response to criticism of past content moderation decisions, Yoel Roth tweeted on December 1st, You can armchair quarterback specific choices and mistakes all day, but the real work is figuring out how to make principled decisions when all you have are bad options. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Going over to the border, about 1,500 illegal migrants crossed the Rio Grande overnight Sunday into El Paso, Texas. This amid an increase in migrant crossings before the end of a pandemic-era order. Some of the migrants carried children in their back, on their backs as they waded into the river to cross from Juarez into the United States. U.S. Customs and Border Protection on Sunday encountered about 2,400 illegal immigrants attempting to enter the El Paso sector, which includes all of New Mexico and part of Texas. Meanwhile, U.S. officials are preparing for a possible further rise in illegal crossings beginning December 21st. That's when the order called Title 42 is set to expire. It was originally intended to stem the spread of COVID and allows authorities to rapidly expel illegal immigrants. In other news, a raft with over 10 Cubans on board was intercepted on Monday by the Cuban Coast Guard while attempting to leave the island bound for the United States. A witness who helped two rafters said they paid around 285 U.S. dollars to get on the U.S. bound raft and flee the island. Two Coast Guard boats assisted the rafters and pulled the vessel back to the island. A severe economic downturn in Cuba has driven a massive spike in migration from the Caribbean island. Some immigrants attempt to reach Florida on rickety vessels, though most fly to Central America or Mexico and reach the U.S. border by land. A record 220,000 Cubans were stopped at the U.S.-Mexico border in fiscal year 2022, shattering previous records. The vast majority were allowed into the U.S. to pursue immigration cases. And supporters of outgoing Bra Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro attempted to invade the federal police headquarters and the Capitol on Monday. The protest was triggered by the arrest of indigenous leader and Bolsonaro ally Jose Cervantes. Footage from the protest shows burned out cars and a bus that had been set on fire. Police used stun grenades and rubber bullets to keep the protesters back. The Supreme Court issued a 10-day arrest of Savante for allegedly carrying out anti-democratic acts. The Supreme Court said the arrest was based on evidence of crimes of threat, persecution and violent abolition of the democratic state of law. The arrest of Savante and the resulting protest occurred on the same day the federal electoral court certified the victory of Bolsonaro's socialist rival Lula da Silva. Bolsonaro has yet to concede defeat to Lula, but he has not blocked off the handover of power. 
The Supreme Court says Savante led protests across capital city Brasilia and used his position as chief of the Savante people to enlist both indigenous and non-indigenous people to commit crimes. Bolsonaro supporters have camped outside military bases around the country, urging the armed forces to overturn the results of, con- of the country's presidential election. The disgraced South Carolina attorney accused of killing his family will stand trial this January. Alec Murdoch's wife and son were found shot to death in the family's home more than a year ago. Now, for the first time, prosecutors are sharing a possible motive in the case. I think the police took the answers immediately. My wife and child shot badly. Alex Murdoch says he called 911 after finding his wife and son bleeding at their hunting property in Islington, South Carolina. 52-year-old Maggie Murdoch was shot and killed with a rifle, and their son, 22-year-old Paul Murdoch, was killed with a shotgun. Alex Murdoch has denied harming them, but prosecutors now say he had a motive for allegedly killing them, to hide his alleged financial crimes and shift the attention away from his finances. Prosecutors claim Alex Murdoch defrauded clients, co-workers, and family members of nearly $9 million. The day of reckoning, was upon him, and he was out of cards to play. That alleged motive dates back to a February 2019 boat crash, during which Paul Murdoch was allegedly driving drunk. 19-year-old Mallory Beach was killed in that crash, and because Alex Murdoch owned the boat, her family filed a civil suit against him. On June 10, 2021, a hearing in that case was scheduled, at which Alex Murdoch was likely going to be told to reveal his financial records. But that hearing never happened. Maggie and Paul Murdoch were killed just a few days before it was supposed to take place, so it was canceled. In a recent court filing, prosecutors allege that if the release of Murdoch's financial records was granted at that hearing, it would have led to his misdeeds becoming exposed and would have resulted in personal, legal, and financial ruin for Murdoch. He's still trying to prevent who he really is from being out. What he does do is kill his wife and son, who who were liabilities in the boat case, and immediately it stops everything. Murdoch's defense team pushed back on the alleged motive in court. Mr. Murdoch had handwritten out a financial statement um, for purposes of that hearing. There's no doomsday reckoning in that regard. Still, motive or not, a source with knowledge of the investigation told me blood spatter was found on Alex Murdoch's clothing, which could prove he was in close proximity to at least one of the victims when they were shot. That same source also told me a video found on Paul Murdoch's cell phone contains audio of Alex Murdoch talking with his family at the scene around the time the slayings occurred, well before his call to 911 at 10.07 p.m. Prosecutors say Maggie and Paul were killed between 8.30 and 10.06 p.m. that night. And the audio on Paul's cell phone puts Alex Murdoch at the scene at 8.44 p.m. According to the state, Murdoch left the property at 9.06 p.m. to drive to his father's house and upon returning, called 911 at 10.07 p.m. Just ahead, workers in Philadelphia removed a box that covered the statue of Christopher Columbus on Sunday. The statue has been covered for over two years. And parents across the nation have sparked a movement to get explicit books out of schools. We spoke with a mom who is leading the charge. Get this. This is Stephen K. Bannon. I urge you to protect your savings from inflation by diversifying into a physical gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. Simply text the word NTD to 989898 and you'll get a free info kit on gold IRAs explaining everything. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. I see the future is really bright for me. The high school diploma is just added to the confidence and now I feel unstoppable. 
Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Welcome back. Following a two-year legal battle, the city of Philadelphia is required to remove a box that has covered a statue of Christopher Columbus. Here's the story. Workers in Philadelphia on Sunday finished removing the box that covered the statue of Christopher Columbus in Marconi Plaza. A Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania panel recently ruled that the city must take down the box. It had been covering the statue since the George Floyd protests in the summer of 2020. I am very delighted that we have prevailed in the legal challenges and that the city has chosen to obey the court order and has removed the box. George Bocetto is an attorney who represents the plaintiffs in the lawsuit against the city. Philadelphia's mayor started a process in 2020 to remove the statue. It was presented to the city in 1876 by the Italian-American community in honor of Columbus, who was Italian. This is a symbol for an entire ethnic group. This is a symbol of their accomplishments, their, their hard work. Don't forget, many of these Italian-Americans, as they were working very difficult jobs and, and hard, long years, they were contributing to have statutes and monuments erected. The court panel found that the city violated a rule governing how public input is received on a proposal to remove public artwork. We hope this is a model for the entire country, and we think that uh, when it comes to ethnic monuments and documents, uh, our, our governments have to learn how to be tolerant of all ethnic groups. This is not just a, a victory for the Italians. This is a victory for every ethnic group that has their own monuments, their own holidays, their own traditions, their own heritages. The Philadelphia mayor's office said in a statement that they are very disappointed in the court's ruling. The mayor's office said the Christopher Columbus statue has been a source of controversy in Philadelphia and should be removed from its current position. And a Texas mom is leading the charge in letting sexually explicit books out of school libraries. She shares with Entity her thoughts on the issue and why more parents need to get on board. Here's the story. Parents across the nation have now sparked a movement to get books with explicit content out of schools, but with much backlash. We are told that we are censoring, that we are book burners, that we are um, censoring speech. That Kristen Bentley from Tyler, Texas, is a special education advocate, a state Republican Party official, and chair of the Stop Sexualizing Texas Kids subcommittee. But above all, she is a mom. There is no one better prepared to defend children than a parent. In 2021, State Representative Matt Krause wrote to the Texas Education Agency. He listed 850 books he considered inappropriate for school children. As a lawmaker inquired if these books were available in Texas schools, many parents took the initiative to find out. My initial investigation or audit of the school library where my son attends uh, revealed about 120 books, and I was shocked. Through Bentley's advocacy, her son's school district has removed over 200 books for special review. According to a PEN America report, Texas tops the nation for banning 801 books for various reasons in schools so far. The report titled, Banned in the USA, the growing movement to censor books in school, says the result will be students losing access to literature. However, Bentley disagrees. The books that we're finding are so sexually graphic and, and um, the books that we're finding, they literally go into extremely graphic detail about sexual acts between men and women, between um, men and men, women and women. Bentley advises parents to check their school district's library systems for explicit books, understand their content, and then bring to the school administrators attention for removal. And so we don't go after or support, you know, removing any books that just have maybe some ideas that we don't like. But if they are pervasively vulgar and inappropriate, they can be removed. The Texas mom shares her hope that more parents can join the cause. She says people can learn more information on TexansWakeUp.com or TexasFreedomCoalition.com. NTD News, Texas. 
And next, let's find out what's going on with our economy. The Federal Reserve's two-day meeting starts today, and many are also waiting for the latest CPI numbers that will be released later in the day. But meanwhile, we heard from our sponsor, Birch Gold Group, to hear what they expect of the economy. We're bringing back Philip Patrick. He is a precious metal specialist with our sponsor, Birch Gold Group. Good to see you again, Philip. And you, as always. Um, so first, please give us an update. It's been uh, the Federal Reserve's goal for a while to reduce inflation to 2%. Looking at the recent numbers, how are we faring? Uh, not too well. Um, we've seen a, a slight reduction in overall inflation. It came from 83 down to about 7.7%. However, the concerning part, first of all, obviously, that's almost four times the Federal Reserve's target of 2%. The other side of things is where we're seeing meaningful price reductions. It's not coming from essentials. In fact, essentials all shooting up still. Food at work and, and school, public transportation, energy prices, all very, very high still. The only meaningful reductions are really coming from the non-essentials, uh, live sporting tickets, television computer equipment. For me, it's concerning. This is more of a sign of people changing spending behavior in anticipation of recession, more so than the Fed really having a handle on inflation. So I think looking at the numbers, they still have a lot of work to do. Mm, interesting. And you were also mentioning the stock market, but we've been seeing it a little bit of more of an up and down. So what's going on there? There's lots of volatility, as you rightly point out, in the markets. And I think for me, this is a sign of very late stage bubble behavior. What we're seeing, and it's interesting, we're seeing a market that's moving more really on sentiment rather than fundamentals, right? Hopes and prayers rather than dollars and cents. And we're being seeing big swings based on the news of the day, right? The Fed come out and say, hey, we're going to raise half a percent instead of three quarters in December. And of course, the markets rally. They see this as a sign of a dovish for Fed. The market rallies 700 points in a day. For me, these sort of movements are concerning since when did Federal Reserve minutes mean more than earnings reports, right? And we're starting starting to see that. For me, concerning side, uh, and it's typical at the end of a bubble prior to, to times of recession. So concerning. Hmm. That's interesting. So how should we secure ourselves financially then? Where should we put our money? Look, I think the, the most important thing today is to stay informed, right? And that for us at Birch Gold Group is a big part of what we do. We try and give people the information. And of course, anyone listening to this show can access free information. I think they text NTD to 989898. There's a lot of good information on investing in precious metals. They're incredibly conducive for climates like this, right? When inflation rises, it drives gold and silver up. When we see periods of stock market decline, it drives gold and silver up. So I think everyone needs to be thinking about hedging their exposure heading into next year. Precious metals in a climate of stagflation are very conducive. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Philip Patrick with Birch Gold Group. I appreciate it. Thank you, Evelyn. Coming up, Christmas is fast approaching, and while most of the country prepares for cold weather and snow, Florida is preparing for a different kind of Christmas. The lasting beauty of realistic oil painting. Brilliant, expressive, and inspirational. The 6th NTD International Figure Painting Competition. Guided by pure authenticity, beauty, and goodness, invites you to join us on a journey back to traditional art. The gold award is $10,000. For more details, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Good to have you back with us. It's the holiday season and Florida's warm weather is taking no time off. With warm temperatures and the Winterfest Boat Parade, Florida provides a different kind of Christmas. Entity's Flinders Kingsley has the story. It's Christmas time in Florida and temperatures are a balmy 80 degrees. At that temperature, you're much more likely to get a tan than get snow. But you can get a photo with the smiling snowman sculpture on the main strip of Fort Lauderdale Beach. 
Uh, well, it's nice. The weather is amazing in here. Uh, we are from Europe, so we have the four season there. Uh, and it's definitely nicer here. Look, we are in t-shirts. We are in December. Fort Lauderdale holds the Winterfest Boat Parade, which organizers call the seventh largest spectator event in the United States. And with Florida's 300 miles of inland waterways, why not? We're the longest boat parade in the world. We're 12 miles, um, so that's a big deal and lots and lots of opportunity for spectators. Every restaurant is sold out, every hotel is sold out, and along the shores, private parties, charity events. Around 100 boats are decorated in Christmas lights and sail through the city with fireworks flashing. It's just beautiful. I mean, you get to see so many different people. Everybody's dressed up festively. And of course, the boats, very innovative, bright, beautiful, fun. A special viewing area near Los Olas Boulevard Bridge sold out to a crowd of 3,000. The temperature may not feel like winter, but the atmosphere definitely feels like Christmas. Flinders Kingsley, NTD News. You know, in Florida, they decorate the palm trees as well as the pine trees. Mm, yes, in Australia, they also decorate pine trees, but sometimes people will just use a branch from a eucalyptus tree as their Christmas tree. Oh, eucalyptus, I love it. It's so refreshing. But don't you have a story about our little furry friends? That's right, thanks. Uh, one of the hottest hotels in Chicago has just opened, and it already has a growing waiting list. And none of us will be allowed because it's only for bunnies. That means Chicago owners of the furry creatures now have a new option to house their little friends when they go on vacation, complete with a spa and boutique. It's the first of its kind, and for the rabbits, there's not much else to want for. And today's cost, Jimenez, tells us what's in store for them. Airbnb Rescue Spa and Boutique, or simply known as Airbnb, officially opened in Chicago two weeks ago. Complete with Persian rugs, chewable privacy huts, and even spa packages that come with massages and pampering, it's a first-of-its-kind luxury hotel for bunny rabbits. We want to provide the most um, caring and luxurious experience for pet rabbits while their owners are out of town. Airbnb is already proving to be quite a hit. Despite being a new establishment, it already has a growing waiting list. In addition to her work at the B&B, Marcia Coburn is also president of the Red Door Animal Shelter, a no-kill shelter in Chicago. We do cats, rabbits, dogs, the occasional backyard chicken and pet duck. Oh, and button quails we've rescued too. <laughs> All profits from the newly opened hotel will go towards helping animals at the shelter. So we're helping them out by giving them a nice place to stay and take care of them. But we're also raising money to help the animals who have yet to find their forever homes. Coburn says each year Red Door Animal Shelter helps nearly 300 bunny rabbits find homes. Cost MNS, NTD News. Oh, that's really great. You know, Evelyn, I love that vintage wall art they have. <laughs> yes. Did you see that they had somebody, I think, reading from a book to them? Oh, man, that's, that's the treatment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, that's all for today's program. We'd love to hear from you. Before you go, share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at ntd.com. Write us if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.